Hello and welcome to another episode of Soul Nectar Show. That show where we talk about all things essence, where we gather around the campfire and we share our stories of connection to that which is bigger than us, to the great mystery, to beyond the veil, to those synchronistic moments that lead us to our soul's destiny, to what we're here to learn and grow and understand and then share with others. I'm your host, Carrie Hummingbird, and I love these conversations. I love having you here with us, all of you. And I'm excited because... Uh, you know, every time we have one of these shows, I learn something new, you learn something new, hopefully, and we grow together as a community. And if you like community and you want community support for your soul's evolution path, then please, you know, come into my website and book a little chat with me, uh, kerryhummingbird.com, K-E-R-R-I, hummingbird.com, and we can have a chat about what's going on with you and whether or not the community I have would serve your growth. And today's guest on Soul Nectar Show is going to serve your growth with some really fascinating uh, conversation that he's been through in his life. Uh, Dave Pama is here. Welcome, Dave. Hi. Thanks for having me uh, on the show. Very pleased to be here. Absolutely. So Dave is an author, a podcaster, and a personal coach who helps people overcome Resiliency. As an athlete and retired firefighter, he faced many challenges with racism, bullying, and dyslexia. His experiences led him to a career in helping others through personal coaching and with his book, Firefighting from Within. Dave hosts the podcast, The Dave Palma Show, and I've been on that podcast, where he highlights ways people can make improvements in their lives and other mental health topics. He says that people need to build resiliency by using mindfulness to gain some calmness in your life. And having more positivity positivity can help you live your best life. I certainly agree with that. And we're going to find out more about your journey to discovering that today, Dave. So welcome to the show. Oh, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me again. And uh, very pleased to share my uh, my story and uh, what my knowledge that I might be able to share with the audience today as well. Yeah, I was very intrigued when you said um, firefighter. You know, we talked about that before on your show. And firefighting, what an interesting occupation and yeah. how to how to face your fears, right? I mean, I lead people on fire walks. You know, we walk across okay. hot coals. Okay, yeah. Okay, um, so you're well, like so going into a burning building t- trying to make it stop. <laughs> I mean, we certainly, uh, I certainly would have walked on a lot of fires, you know, because you can't see sometimes where you're going, you know, when you, you don't know what you're going to, what incidents. Um, but we do have the protective gear or PPE. A lot of people are aware of what PPE is now, um, personal protective equipment, obviously with the COVID era. Um, so um, it's slightly different to fire walking the type that you do. So um, uh, yeah, although it's more danger, you know, because it's not as controlled as, you know, with what you do. Yeah, ours walking. is controlled. And then we put it yeah. down little embers so, and then we spread them all out so there's only a really thin layer you know so it's all really <laughs> mitigated so but your situation was not so how did you get into firefighting why did you choose that did you always want to be a firefighter and then I, it was one of the things always in the back of my mind when you know i got excited about when i was at school more, more as a as a teenager uh, than a youngster i probably maybe had some you know idea about it when i was sort of elementary school you call it we call it primary school but yeah, as I was in uh, secondary or high school and leaving, I wanted to join. Um, it's hard to get into and I had to wait a long time. Um, and then um, I was doing also sports, mostly at track and field athletics, actually, which kept me fit. So fitness was part of the you know, entry requirements to become a firefighter. So it all, all fitted in and I learned a lot of personal development, actually, from you know, looking at sports psychology and physiology and you know, the fitness side of things as well. So. Um, yeah, eventually uh, applied and uh, became a firefighter in my early 20s. Um, so, yeah. It's... That's a pretty powerful journey. Um, I know what it takes to, I don't personally know because I never tried to be a firefighter, but I have friends who did the training. You can actually yeah. do the training to be a firefighter for just for fitness reasons, apparently. And oh, really? Yeah, imagine. and you can like go through, there's like a coach out here, I think, that does it. And that's pretty intense training to be a firefighter. It's a lot of, you have to be able to, you know, have good stamina. You've got to be able to lift a lot of weight. You've got to be able to act quickly, move your body quickly. Like there's a lot to it. Yeah. Um, yeah, certainly yeah, as you're going through, but most of it is when you're using the equipment. So um, you're, you're wearing the, the fire gear 
or the PPE, I should say, you know, the helmet and everything, boots. Um, and then uh, you have to do lots of stuff like lifting ladders, uh, the, fight, the ceiling hook, that's like a stick and you're sort of pulling the ceiling down. Um, obviously climbing stairs, wearing the breathing apparatus, the cylinders where you, you know, you've got a mask to breathe through smoke, etc. So a lot of the fitness is based, it's more functional, so it's based around um, all that. So um, yeah, it can get quite strenuous. Um, but it's for it's, it's a job that's open for anyone, any age, gender, race, um, any all types of backgrounds. Uh, you know, it's, it's, um, you so know, in it's, your journey, like, what do you just what do you talk about in your book, firefighting from within? Because you obviously, uh, learned, was, you know, you were a firefighter on the outside, and then you had to learn uh, how to firefight on the inside. Yeah, the idea came with as you mentioned at the beginning. I did go through some sort of, um, you know discriminatory uh, uh, stuff before I joined the fire service as well, there was stuff going on. Well, you can see in society and in America what's going on now with racism, but also bullying at school for various reasons, I had dyslexia. So um, uh, when I discovered all that, I actually didn't find out about my dyslexia until I was like in my 40, uh, 40 years old, I think. So uh, it's quite late on, um, I was studying a degree part-time, you know, while I was uh, working as a firefighter. So, um, just a lot of that personal development stuff came up and then um, of course life coaching and motivational speaking was getting quite huge and obviously with people like Anthony Robbins and, and yourself Kerry so <laughs> um, you know I, I took a more of an interest. I'm in the same league <laughs> <laughs> you just put us in the same sentence so you know the idea of writing a book you know because of my dyslexia it's more of a challenge and there was motivation speaker in who's slightly deaf who was in my network on Facebook just like you found me and she said she's going to help me so she contributed and co-authored it just to help me write it because I didn't really know much about writing a book and then uh, that's when the idea came so in the book she put some of her chapters but it was really taking some lessons in life that I learned at school how I maybe overcame some of the, the bullying or what I went through and then at some of the incidents I went to some of the biggest ones that were quite you know major um, and just talking about Things like you know overcoming fear and um, you know um, just over, just personal development stuff really, but using my experiences and then putting some bullet points of what what you know learning points there are. It's it's really like um, a quick read, not a too short a handbook. It is a book, but it's not a, a you know one where you have to sit down and think, oh, right, I want to get through this really thick novel, you know, like Stephen King. So it's very, pretty much yeah, like Stephen that. King novel. So yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Quick, what do you, mean. how do you get yourself into a burning building? I mean, if it's really looking scary, like how do you motivate yourself to get in there and, and start fighting that fire? Well, I think it's really the, the, the training, first of all. So um, I was quite, um, not too nervous, but obviously, you know, you, the first fire I went to, I was thinking, I wonder what's going to, you know, go on. but I was looking forward to it. In terms of I've done all this training, I'm, I'm ready to help, you know, that, that's kind of thing. Um, and it didn't turn out to be, you know, some firefighters just go to the biggest incident they've ever been to, you know, as a raw recruit or, you know, they sort of end up just going to, you know, something really huge. And um, I've been to a few that's really burning fiercely and had rescues to do. And it's quite a challenge, you know, the heat, you, you really try to, to stand it and, and parts of your ears and, you know, you're still although you wear some kind of protection around your head but you can still feel it even though you've got the gloves and the personal protection equipment on um so it does get very hot you can feel it and then if you get the psychological um challenge of rescuing and you know but you've done the, you've done the training um and you're looking forward to it and you've got a great team teamwork is very imperative so everything you know have to rely on what's going on outside with the you know the the fire truck and the water being provided to you, radio communication between the officer in charge, you know, the, the, the um, fire captain, you call them. <laughs> but, uh, so it's all teamwork, you know, um, and then of course, all the training that we've done, we, we unleash it in whatever scenario we find ourselves in. It's not just fire as it could be. I mean, as I said, I've mentioned about a major train cr railroad crash or train crash, which exploded into a massive fire as well. Um, and lots of people, you know, so many died and some we rescued some spent hours so that i mentioned that in the book but gave it more of the psychology it's called the psychology of motivation so it's how we are motivated to to do do the rescue and the firefighting 
did you find yourself like having heroic impulses, like just b bigger than you in those situations where you see someone needs to be rescued and you're going in? Do you find yourself something bigger than you that takes over to support you to do that? Um, I think it, it's that, that saying it's all in a day's, day's job or day's work. It, it's true, really. It, it's something you're trained for. And I, I didn't really think, yeah, Superman, I'm taking this cape. I mean, there are some that are like that, you know, the real kind of showman type, <laughs> you know. Um, but it wasn't like that for me, you know. And I, I was hoping I could, you know, I was maybe looking at promotion. And you know, I did do some managerial stuff in the fire prevention department again before I retired. So I was tempted to promote it like that. So, um, I had more of that kind of mindset, you know, which is probably coaching and suited me with management and leadership, you know, and stuff like that. So, and also with my track and field, you know, I was doing some coaching, helping the young athletes. So I had the more of that kind of helping nature, which is why I'm doing what I'm doing now with the podcast and the coaching, you know. Um, I mean, when I retired, I also was doing some fire safety work, uh, which is also helping as well. But, um, you know, I had a lot, of, I thought I put everything in one bag, not just only about my, you know, career, but everything in life and put it around sort of life coaching and my podcast. So, yeah, so so how does racism fit into this for you? Because I know this is a global conversation that we're yeah. having now. And you know, but people have different experiences in different parts of the world too. So what's your, what's been your experience of how that affects something like the teamwork that you've got to do in the fire department? It's got to be seamless, right? Everyone's got to get along and be synchronized and do the job. But if there's racism coming up then that's that's getting in the way well, isn't it without a shadow of a doubt um you know um they're bringing up the word systemic racism which is um institutional racism if you like as well calling it so the public sector in the uk was found that you know most public sectors and, and some jobs had that uh, and it's just the way people get promoted and it's just the way the system is you know in terms of um, I'm, I'm, you as a, as a woman, it's the same thing, you know, with patriarchy and, you know, I've got a politics to be on, so I know gender and race, you know, has their own kind of way of how you get discriminated. So when you look at the system, patriarchal is more the, the, the women's sort of discrimination way, what happens in institutions and uh, systemic racism for, people, you know, people of colour and, you know, moment of Black Lives Matter, you know. Um, but when I was younger, um, it was around the time I was growing up in the 70s. Um, so um, Nelson Mandela was still in prison. You know, a lot of talk was around that. There was a lot of racism in the UK, um, you know, a lot of comments being made. Um, I was called many, but I didn't understand it until later. And, you know, there was organisations, very far right wing organisations, a bit like what's going on in America now with right and left you know with the anti-fascism and you know the prayer boys if you like so that kind of thing was going on in the 70s in the uk you know but more more the fascist type groups were there to say my mum and dad were immigrants to say you know kick them out of the country get them out you know like that a bit like i don't want to get into your politics but it's the kind of what's going on in america now you know with what trump some of his language yeah and I don't want to get this in, shifting into politics, but of course I do mention racism because it's what I've been around is what is yeah. going on in America. America is quite severe, what we can see, which is why the whole world's looking at what's going on in the election for many reasons. One of them is is that. Um, and then I, what I experienced in school, more high school would be like, or secondary school we call it, you know, I ended up in a couple of fights. I think I mentioned one in the book, um, possibly, you know, maybe around my dyslexia as well, but certainly, uh, being called certain racial names, you know, based on the colour of my skin. And, and that was all based around some of the groups, right wing groups that was around, that sort of stuff. So a lot was going on. Uh, and then there were riots in the 80s. 81, there were riots, race riots, and it involved the police. And there was distrust between the black community and the police at that time and in the mid 80s. By then, I was on fully fledged, just doing my schoolwork and then going to the athletics track, doing my training. And then just going home, but I was right in the middle of all that in my community, you know, so um, couldn't miss it, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, it's part of the part of what yeah. created who you are is by being surrounded by all of that activity. And how did your parents handle that with you? How did you how did they help you support you? To yeah, my mum was a typically, a, well, I say so typically, but she was an African Caribbean uh, Christian really high, highly raised on Christianity. Um, I, I was went through it, going to Sunday school and that, but then, 
you know, when I turned adulthood, I didn't really practice it anymore. You know, I just go to funerals and <laughs> weddings mostly when I go to church now. But um, it's kind of similar to American Christianity, you know, it's like that really. So, um, so she had that kind of mindset, you know, um, and same with my aunt who had a big influence on us growing up with my brother and sisters, you know, growing up, um, gave more kind of a pass, not a pacifying, obviously it's wrong, um, but more, you know, the difference between Martin Luther King and uh, Malcolm X, you know, there wasn't a violent way around, it was a peaceful way around saying how we can deal with it. Um, but my dad, who's an ex-military, he was the military, it would have been the British Army then because it was still a colony of Britain, uh, his country in Mauritius, which is in the Indian Ocean, not far from South Africa, about four hours flying. So it's like going from where you are to LA, I suppose. But, uh, so he had a military kind of background and he worked as a security in a museum, a very well-known museum in, in the UK. So he had more of that mindset, but he wasn't kind of going out ready to fight the, you know, the, you know, the race, the racism that was coming in his face. But it wasn't really brought in bring hate. Yeah, it could have easily been done that way, but you know, it wasn't. It's just what was around, and yeah, it's just dealt with. Probably just the way I'm, you know, the way my parents were with their mindsets, really. So did you have any direct experiences yourself of where you knew that, hey, I'm being discriminated against? I mean, besides like the, the thing you mentioned in school, but like, let's say in the fire department, did you notice that was happening to you? Could you specifically say like that you were- Well, to be honest, there were, I mean, you do get a few that have got those views, um, just like anywhere else, you know, and I, I wouldn't put it past that there were some sexist views being mentioned, you know, the, you know, <laughs> I don't want to bring the bias service into this uh, to kind of bad name or anything, but there were. But really it's like everywhere. Things. What you're saying is, it's like pretty. Yeah, it's a men's, it was a men's boys club, you know. So the sort of stuff you see, you know, you you know, when they're rest, when they're resting between fires in the locker room and the, the sub language and and it was very hard for. for I, I don't want to change the subject, but it was very hard for the, the very few fi uh, fire women that or female firefighters that were in the job at the time. I knew I worked personally with them. My, they weren't in every station there was only about 49 in the whole of london when i joined and not so many black firefighters but a lot more than so um sexism and the odd racist language was actually brought out but what i didn't look at until the report was written was was the institutional racism and then wondering why there wasn't when you look at promotion i thought maybe it's because there wasn't enough but it was partly not enough done about recruitment but uh, um so the discriminatory thing was more more looking wider than racism when I was in the job, but I did sort of experience and feel it because of what I experienced in the 70s and 80s, you know. Well, in the colonialism, I mean, that really plays a part. Uh, that it's like the hugest part, right, is this attitude of colonialism. And that's been going on for hundreds well, of years. Exactly. So you can imagine that long ago, because in America, the civil rights movement was even more severe than the racism that was you know there was still activism going on in the UK but the US in the 50s and 60s was because whites and it was almost like apartheid whites, whites and blacks weren't allowed to sit next to each other were they no. so you know and, and that's what got me and Martin Luther King was played over and over again when I was in the 70s and 80s and when I was starting to party as you know as Kids, they, they mixed it in with, you know, music, the rap and reggae music with Martin Luther King speeches and maybe a little bit of Malcolm X as well. <laughs> but um, it was like that, you know, so you, you couldn't miss that. And then you definitely couldn't miss, you know, the Nelson Mandela song, Free Mel Nelson Mandela, you know, all that was still going on. Uh, of course, there was other um, characters that were black that was uh, quite, um, you know, evil and spoken about like Idi Amin, you know, <laughs> people like that. So there were certain other things going on. That I, I was very newsworthy. I, I don't know why I had that kind of head, but I, you know, I, I, there was a children's news round that came on and I, you know, things that's going on in Bangladesh, not only in Uganda where, you know, the Asians got, um, my dad was Asian Mauritian, by the way, so I'm, I'm mixed actually. So, you know, they got um, Idi Amin kicked them out. So they were refugees in the UK, not my dad. My dad wasn't, he was just a normal, he was a British citizen still then because it wasn't independent of Britain. Um, but what I'm trying to say is that I, I had a varied sort of a humanitarian um, a feel for social justice in general, you know, 
irrespective. Yeah. Um, and even um, we were, there were um, commercials about what to do if there's an, um, a nuclear bomb goes off and it showed us how to hide under the table or shield ourselves. And that was scary. That's a bit like, I mean, I'm here now. Now they do earthquake drills. I don't know if you get earthquakes in Texas, but um, all kinds of things going on. So my mind wasn't really set on just only racism. And I suppose that's why I became a firefighter because I was thinking I, I want to be, you know, more humane. I'll do something helping people really. And then obviously together with being very sporty, you know, fitness was, you know, my main thing. And I looked at psychology as well, you know, improving yourself, self-improvement. Yeah, because you so, don't yeah, have control over uh, anything outside of you. you. You don't really have control over the, anybody outside of you or how they're going to act or anything like that. And so you just have to go in, right? You have to work through all these issues within and get strong inside of you so that no matter what's going on, you are you can handle it, right? There's a thing, um, one, one of the, um, uh, it's actually quite known and he does a Nesta, he owns Nesta, which is a per, uh, personal training and life coaching institute. So he does the training for that. I, I don't think he's training. And one of the things he said was just be aware of what's going on around you, I meaning the news, but obviously don't be absorbed by it and, you know, worried about it, but only control, focus on what you can control, you know, in life and business and your career, or professionally, whatever. Um, but obviously be around, aware of everything that's around you, because you don't, obviously you need to know what's going on with COVID, so you know what the next step to do is when the vaccine are coming out, what to protect yourself with. So you do need to be aware of the news in terms of that, but not, so it installs fear in you and it, it overtakes your life, you know, you know, only control what you can do about it. And in, in talking about these subjects, you know, like uh, my husband, my husband's African-American. And so we started a podcast called Healing Racism with some friends. Yeah, yeah. So we dove right in when we saw the thing happen and, and all the um, energy came out um, this year in 2020 about the racism and the cops. And we were like, you know, we have to do something. So I think a lot of people felt that way. Like we have to do something about this. We need yeah. to have these conversations. And what was interesting yeah. is that as me and my colleagues started having these conversations, it became really apparent like who didn't want to have the conversation yeah, yeah. <laughs> and who did. So. Um, yeah, yeah, talk about that a little because, you know, you're out here speaking and this is one of the points that's important to talk about. How, what are you finding? Yeah, um, you know what, when I was in, uh, when I first joined the fire service, it was very hard to talk about because they just didn't like it. the team I was around at the time. And I think it was more like the culture. It's a bit like the stigmatization of mental health, which is another thing we can talk about later, but you know, I weren't allowed to talk about racism because it's, oh, you dare talk about that. And then, you know, and then there'd be anger. And I think that's really what caused my kind of discrimination because if you can, now the, the way's paved and a black, new, a black firefighter that's new and recruited 18 years old that walks in in, the, in the London or anywhere, I think in the UK, can sit down and talk about it. You know, like Black Lives Matter, I wouldn't be able to talk about it around, around the table, the kitchen table, you call it, but, you know, where you see firefighters resting and they're eating their meals. It was very difficult then in the night in 1990 when I joined, you know. Hmm. Um, so, so um, you leaned into that conversation though, it sounds like. Well, I, I didn't, I, I, I still wanted to talk about it, so I spoke out as much as possible where possible I could, but I kept quiet where I had to sort of, you know, I'm probably not as talkative, you know, maybe as I could have been, but uh, um, I weren't. You know, I wasn't being aggressive about it or anything. I didn't get into real fights. It, it became more like um, an educated black man. <laughs> like, I'm not saying that, but you know, it was more like that. You know, an educated <laughs> black man just walked into the fire service into a predominantly white male, you know, old school boys club network, you know, in the 70s, 80s, 60s as well. There were five parties probably that were just retiring at the time when I joined, you know, they were, and the, a lot of them, um, I mean, I don't have a problem with the military. I've worked with a lot of military and uh, doing certain things, but at that time, it was that kind of, you know, mindset, you know, in the 60s, it could, you could only join if you were from the military. And there was a bar in the 60s, I think, in the UK, where you, you can, deli actually, until 1976, you could discriminate against black people. You could say, I don't want to employ you. And I can say it's because you're black. We don't want, you know, you, but in 1976, it became illegal to do that. But you know, a bit like what's happening now. What 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 
progress has been made since the civil rights movement when um, blacks and whites were allowed to sit together on a bus. You know, has it been much further gone on? Well, you know, what's going on now? It's, it's still some work to be done, isn't there? Well, there is, and, and but the thing is that what I noticed <clears throat> is that what my parents did, so my mom was very concerned about this issue growing up in Texas, in Midwest yeah. Texas, where there was a lot of racism out in the oil towns and places like uh, that. But yeah. there's also a lot of Christianity. So it's funny how they go together, right? Like I'm Christian and I'm racist. Yeah. <laughs> no, but right. I don't want to yeah. know that I'm racist because I know it's bad. It's huh? What, what's bad? The racism. Oh. Yeah. So like, so the Christian mentality I mean, is like, I'm perfect and I'm, I'm pure and I'm chosen. And so this behavior of racism yeah. doesn't, is not compatible with that. And it's obvious that it's not compatible. Mm -hmm. And so there's like this suppression or hiding of it. It's like, oh no, it's not really happening. It's see, it's not really happening. It's not happening That's here. Kind of, when you asked me about, when I said about my mom being a uh, Christian, it's, it, it's happening because obviously it's offensive if it's in your face, which it was in the seventies. But it's kind of like what you're describing. It's kind of, well, let's just push it down. Don't worry about it. You know, God will make uh, make use of them and we'll deal with them. And we'll, we'll just, you know, like that. It wasn't, I want to confront them and I want to speak about it now and, and let's do something about it. You know, my social justice side of me wanted to come out and say, no, let's, let's get Mandela out of court, uh, prison. Let's, you know, deal with what's illegal stuff that's going on, you know? <laughs> so, it's yeah, like so that, it's really. tricky, isn't it? Because like people's identity of themselves as like a good Christian or a good person, but then also having this yeah, yeah. this pattern, family pattern or cultural pattern of, of racism, and they don't want to look, they can't, they don't know how, and isn't this, this is exactly what must have been happening, you know, hundreds of years ago when there was slavery is like, it's not compatible, but we're trying to make it compatible. Like it's not compatible to say you're a good Christian yeah. and then also enslave people. Like yeah. that's, it's not compatible. So this is the essence I think of what's happening in our culture is that this is now coming to the forefront of like, hey, this has never been compatible. It's never been okay. It's never been, you're not a good Christian if you do this, you know, like that's not, it's not true. So you need to stop. Like you need to confront it within yourself and you need to bring yourself into integrity. And uh, so many people are like, I, I don't see it. I'm colorblind. I don't, I, you know, it's like all this denial of what's actually been going on. Yeah. Um... It's a difficult one, really, because um, obviously Martin Luther King was Christ, you know, Christian, wasn't he? Was yeah, he was, and he and he advocated for actual Christian values, like all people should be treated with kindness and and compassion and equality yeah. and freedom, right? He advocated for like that golden path, and so what I'm saying is like yes. there's it's intermingled and it's all tangled up, and so if you're really gonna like promote yourself as like Hi, I'm a Christian, you need to really go to the letter of the law and every single person is equal then every single person's loved under god every single person has compassion and love right there's no discrimination god doesn't discriminate I mean, there are, um there are some christians uh like that. i think what's his name jackson oh, what's his name now reverend jackson uh, the one that yeah. worked with martin luther king is mm -hmm. now i forgot his name now um, there are many that are, that are christian and, and do speak out you know in the same way you know looking at how everyone is equal exactly um, but like i'm saying like there's like communities of people all across the united states for example where it's yeah. they're it's not equal it's not welcoming it's not they're not willing to look at this issue and they just want to say well i'm you know i'm a good christian well yeah you have to look at all these issues in order to really come closer to fulfilling those ideals. You've got to actually be able to look at all these issues within yourself and embrace your neighbor, right? Embrace your neighbor that might be really yeah. different than you. That's true, yeah. And then that's, that, that was pretty apparent, you know, as I say, when I was growing up, you know, there were neighbors, well, luckily our neighbors wasn't racist. <laughs> well, I don't know who they were, but they didn't show it really, you know, we grew up all right together, you know, in that sense. But of course, you know, once you start school and everything, you start to experience and then work in life, you know, you experience various different 
things outside the community in your own, you know, place where you live, really. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I totally agree with you with that. What do you think the solution is, Dave? Uh, uh, the solution, um, obviously, at the moment, I think it's comp continue campaigning. But it's action, isn't it, really? It's, it's really how do you get the, the people... Uh, at the top, because I think they're really the CEOs of company. Not we're not just talking about politicians and, and police chiefs. We're not just only talking about them. We're talking about companies um, and talking about a mindset that shift for them, and then bringing it down to the bottom. Because I, I don't think everybody on the ground is going to take it, from my own experience. Um, and then it's looking at vetting people as they go through the management chains or whatever. I, you know, when people got promoted, I'm thinking, how did they get promoted? Of course, they're good at their job, but you're a manager. You've got to be good at everything else and be a leader, haven't you? Um, so it's really, really looking at that, the mindset shift. Um, or maybe work, work at the top, but also work at, you know, having that mindset shift at the bottom as well in terms of these values. Yeah, isn't it training um, too? Because it's a lot of training that our current, uh, hopefully outgoing president, just um, <laughs> just deleted all the training, the sensitivity training, the cultural bias training, like all of this training. So it you can literally did start writing the executive orders. That was literally where it started to get deleted. So the policies were changing anyway, almost immediately when he came in, weren't they? So. He meant, he meant business, what he was talking about, but obviously he's, he's going around trying to upset international relations, not just only what's going on in America. And see, it's apparent well, now. It's, it's, a, it's a mess, isn't it, at the moment? Well, because to me, it's a mess. And I, I mean, I, I know I have several followers who's probably going to watch this broadcast and say, he's the savior, though. And yeah, yeah. I, the only way that I can embrace that concept is if he's a big archangel savior, it's in showing us our shadows. So that's not to mean to go, yay, more shadows. Woo hoo, let's let the archangel of shadows show us more of our crap. It's yeah. more like, no, we need to be responsible human beings and work on you know, our diversity, our cultural understanding, our own limitations in understanding other people, heal our ancestries, um, to, so that we can be accepting of all people in an equal way. I mean, that's what our constitution says. We've never lived up to it yet. And I feel like if we're going to live up to it, we need to hold ourselves to task to do the inner work, to understand our own biases and change those ideals within ourselves. It's the, the unconscious bias as well. Um, so yeah. it is a matter of looking at yourself. Um, I mean, maybe I could look at myself when I was younger and did I have unconscious bias? Because everyone has it. So did I have any with women? Did I have any with, I don't know, you know, I'm heterosexual. Did I did I really have any with any gay gay people that was working around me or been around, you know? Um, I've never really examined that, but it's, you know, that's another thing is it's looking at your unconscious bias because there, there is certain people at the top. That, but, um, I think that's a good thing about Trump, I'm not saying he's a good person, is that he isn't scared to come out with what is going on with his bias in his head. So, but he's not dealing with it. That's the problem, you know. So he needs to be dealt with. Uh, well, sorry, I don't want to bring. It's your politics. It's your country. And your but election, no, but not. when you see anybody acting that way, it doesn't matter. He's the president, whatever. If you saw any no, no, person in, in leadership, position, he should be in that position. But if you were in a company and you saw somebody acting that way, would you accept that? Would you feel good about your company? Only if you I've shared seen, his values. I've the Holy. people I've seen, like the managers I've seen, like that, are like Trump in the fire service. I'm wondering how the hell did they get promoted? You know, because well, obviously there is that kind of um, there's certain things that goes on, you know, um, in the background and how people sort of get promoted. And it's more of a kind of like, I don't want to let you in and blah blah blah. But you know, there's blocks for other people like myself or someone else. You know, so well, there's been, this concept of insider and outsider is what you're talking about. Like in the club and not in the club. Right, that kind of thing, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of, it, it was, promotion was kind of more like that, you know. Um, and it's good to network, you need to, to network, but make it for everyone, you know, and deal with things properly. So, you know, don't put cover up and put slide 
put things under the carpet, you know. Um, obviously, Nepotism, you know, is very huge. You know, someone's uncle and brother and sister, my sister as well, because it's female high body. So that's not a bad thing, because obviously you want to, you know, do something for your family as well. But don't just make it for one group only or one, you know, gender only or whatever. So. Well, I think that these these um, experiences in life they reveal to us our biases, right? They reveal to us because then as the situation, like let's say you were at the fire department and then you heard a conversation. Now all of a sudden you're sitting back noticing that bias and going, oh, I didn't know that was in me. Here it is. Wow, I'm going to make a new choice. So I think we're always like when we see this president, when we see whatever's going on, we have to make a choice. Like where do I stand with my integrity? And does that integrity align with the actions and words of this person? Because yeah, if exactly. it doesn't align and you act as if it does, then you're out of you're out of balance now. Yeah, it's not. It's no congruency there. There's no congruency or, or authenticity there at all there. So those are the kind of personal development work that needs to be done with managers as well. Because that uh, the problem is with politics, it doesn't work like that. It's who they vote in, and that's why I mentioned Idi Amin because it's not a race thing. It's kind of like you're letting a wrong personality deal with certain things. And that's why there's some evil people doing some nasty things in the world that are at the top that can, that can do it, you know? Um, but uh, yeah, it's just at the moment, you know, you're obviously dealing with a leader that let's see what happens next week. Um, I'm only telling it from an international point of view, you know, he's obviously going around upsetting the international relations. That's, that's created peace around the world. I think he's trying to upset the boat a bit there. You know, um, really, I think, I don't know, I can't help thinking he's getting at Barack Obama as well. I, I think I had a guest once that said, I think he actually really went, went, I think, he spoke about going for president 20 years ago. There was a clip of him, a video clip, but he really went for it. And I think a lot of the executive orders were, you know, um, reversing what Obamacare's done, reversing what, you know, the climate change uh, international Agree Paris Agreement was, you know, reversing it's that all the executive orders got signed almost overnight as soon as he, you know, so you can see he's going for international stuff that Obama's done some good work for, I think, you know, so um, that'll be interesting anyway. Uh, yeah, well, and at the very least, um, it all comes out in the wash, you know, so what I know about this year is that every, you know, this year is a year of making up your own mind. There, There is no one right truth and um, people believe what they want very passionately right now. And um, we can't seem to meet in the middle. And also we're being manipulated by the algorithms on social media to get entrenched into our positions and then to fight about it. So yeah. when you look at the larger context of what's going on, certain people really being entrenched in one perspective, other people being very entrenched in another perspective, the manipulation on social media to make that even more deep. And you can see that regular humans could just have a conversation and, and come to an understanding a lot quicker. There's a lot of misinformation too. So this is why I don't get too caught up because I know that every single human being, every human being alive has mistakes. Every human yeah. being alive has biases. I have my That's own. Right. And all we can do right now is decide like, you know, what leader is going to bring us um, more potential towards unity? Like, and people have different perspectives about that too. So I guess we'll just see what happens. And whatever happens, we'll deal with yeah. it, you know, pretty much. But I think you're right. It comes down to the grass level at some point, because if the leadership can't be an in integrity, then it's up to the people. Well, exactly. And that's what you're seeing at the moment in America, what's going on. And other countries as well having protests for various other reasons. Um, so it's really... The problem is that when you look at the ground level, there's two, two, two sides, of course. Like now I've mentioned, obviously, the fascist side and the extreme right-wing side and the extreme left-wing side and the people in the middle um, making the protests. So, um, but of course, in America, when, in our country as well, freedom of speech, it's allowed, isn't it, really? The good thing about it is that you can hear the arguments and then sort of see what is right and wrong, see the difference between what is right and wrong, and then it's up to the system, even the judicial system, to put that right, you know, which is another thing, really, is 
putting your stuff through the stuff that's going on now at the moment in America through Congress, you know, what's the Supreme Court going to deal with, you know, and things like that. It doesn't stop at only the president, really, but uh, it is a system in that set sense. And then obviously in America, very much they're looking at the social justice system. Is it broken? You know? mm. Yeah, is it broken? The justice system. Yeah, our justice system, <laughs> probably, because it's, yeah. I mean, he's filling all the justice I'm, 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 slots I'm, I'm, before I'm, I'm, he even... Saying. He's filling all the justice slots while he has time, you know, before the new administration comes in. So he's just like filling it all up with his viewpoint so that, you know, then we have justices that are yeah. with that viewpoint for the next, you know, however, like on the Supreme Court, however long they live. Scary. So yeah. that's where we're at. But, you know, I, that's why I think it's, you know, if you can't depend on your leaders then you need to like, you need to lead yourself. Like you need to start leading and joining with others in community. And so like more of a popular movement like the civil rights movement. Well, exactly, yeah. I mean, that, it, it, in a way that is still going on now. I don't think it ever went away, did it, the civil rights movement, so. No, it's still trying, just, it's been it's going strong, trying to, yeah. yeah. Well, so that sounds like just, the solution, which is why it's important to, to know how to fight those fires within yourself, huh, Dave? <laughs> that's right, <laughs> exactly. Well, that, that's been a big part of my life, I suppose, is, is that sense of social justice and, and fighting that. Obviously, with bullying, there's this outright bullying, irrespective of who that person is, it, you know, it's affected me and then I, I see it going on somewhere else, you know. But with that side, with, when you look at the definition of bullying, anyone could be a bully any group can be a bully or one person as in Trump could be offensive to a certain group of people, you know, so it's, uh, it's when you look at the definition, it's, you know, bullying is, it really makes any group or certain person be a bully or, or could be a bully in a certain situation, you know, sometimes bullying is used as a, like in sports, it's used a lot, but used in a kind of, oh, well, they bullied their way into being champions, you know, with, I've got through that defense by bullying his way through, or whatever so it's it's a word that's kind of used you know in other for other other means but in terms of using bullying on a political matter in terms of the same as racist or racist bullying if you like that kind of offensive bullying i felt it and i know i don't see it as something that's good really you know, when, when i see a certain group bullying someone or someone being offensive to a certain group you know so, and obviously even with terrorism that's you know obviously not a good thing and <laughs> people want to do something about that you know yeah it seems like if the antidote to bullying is is having your personal sovereignty and encouraging others to have personal sovereignty and acting according to their own inner compass rather than joining with others and trying to intimidate other people into doing what they want right so this is a turn in consciousness too into being inner guided rather than outer guided yeah, yeah, it's probably more of an internal. Yeah, I suppose it could, but I'm not sure really if it's just letting your own feelings or. Um, it can be it can be something that's influenced outside as well, I think. I never thought of it. That way, to be <laughs> I right, that's a new concept. So yeah. so tell me, uh, Dave, like how do people uh, find your book? Is it on Amazon? Yeah, it's on Amazon um, and in many countries, so you can more or less get it. It's, it's international. It's on Barnes and Nobles as well. Um, it, it, I've got a YouTube trailer, so it goes direct to the, um, it, although it's independent, I'm an independent author, it is it produced through Balboa, which is part of Hay House. So um, there's a link there, get it, you can get it directly downloaded. But yeah, certainly get it on Amazon as well. Awesome. And uh, how do people uh, find out more about you? I mean, obviously your podcast, I can link to your podcast. Um, right. So you can get, get uh, information about me on my website blog, which is davepalmer.com. That's D-A-V-E-P-A-M-A-H.com. Um, and mostly it's, I, I used to do some blogging, but I'm, I'm really not into <laughs> reading and writing too much. So I, I love, I love my podcasting. So you'll see mostly podcasting there. Um, I'm, I might look at doing some YouTube vlogs a lot of vlogs but uh, so um yeah just go there and uh you'll find all the information about me 
Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll put those links in the show notes. And um, if everybody here, if you um, really enjoyed this episode, you can share it out with anybody that you think might want to hear some of the content in this episode. And Dave, we're going to give people kisses on the way out. Are you ready to give kisses? We're going to give kisses. All oh, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There you go. Mwah, mwah, mwah. Thank you, everybody. Cool, by the way. <laughs> no, <laughs> I know, I just made you do it. You've got to get out of your comfort zone. You've got to try and do <laughs> I just made you walk across fire just with kisses. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, it's true. <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> we'll see you guys next week on Soul Nectar Show. Bye for now.